But he's not he's not buying the idea of armed rebellion. He's looked at what the Boers have done in South Africa. He doesn't think they can be successful. So he's not keen on the idea of an armed rebellion and he's not keen on the 1916 Rising. Mm. He welcomes the formation of the Irish Volunteers in 1914 because he thinks it will give greater purpose and greater discipline and a greater focus to Irish nationalism, but he doesn't want to see bloodshed. Uh, of course, the Ulster Volunteers uh, are a counterweight. <laughs> and he welcomed that. He yeah. welcomed the intransigence of the Ulster Unionists because he thought it gave a sterling example, if you'll excuse the irony of that, a sterling example to Irish nationalists. And he wasn't alone in that. Mm. Uh, going back to that uh, dual monarchist bit, he thought that that might be a sop to the Unionists uh, that would allow them to yeah, go Yeah, but along only a sop. It. I mean, he doesn't excavate that very much and Unionists don't take it very seriously yeah. anyway. And if there is a blind spot in Griffith's thinking, and perhaps arguably there are many blind spots, that is one of them. He was a geographic determinist. In other words, he believed that all of the people on the Ireland, on the island of Ireland, belong to the Irish nation, whether they liked it or not. Now, post the executions in 1916, uh, everything was changed, changed utterly. Uh, and so we have um, the, the move to elections and we have uh, great political forces at work. Where was Griffith in all of that? Well, Griffith was in jail after the 1916 Rising, even though he didn't participate in it. Uh, he enjoyed his time in jail. Uh, curiously enjoyed. enough, okay. uh, he actually started a newspaper in jail uh, <laughs> for the amusement of his fellow prisoners. And I suppose he had the time and the focus <laughs> to, 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 to go at his passion uh, with great intensity. Um, but this is the, the interesting thing, then, the fallout of 1916. What happens to Griffith? Griffith is, you know, president of Sinn Féin, which, as I mentioned, has a new recognition now. Of course, you have De Valera, the sole surviving commandant of the 1916 Rising, who was already recognised as a leader in waiting. And what they essentially agree on in 1917, they have a private meeting. Griffith agrees to step down in favour of De Valera as president of Sinn Féin, and Griffith serves as vice president. But there's still a dilemma. What are you going to do with the dual monarchy idea? Uh, and this is where Sinn Féin, essentially in October 1917, decide on a fudge. And the fudge is that they will aim for a republic, but ultimately when they achieve the republic, the people can decide what form of government uh, they have. Okay. So it's an Irish solution to an Irish problem. And it's Sinn Féin's solution to Sinn Féin's problem because Griffith was distrusted as being too moderate by many of the new radicals, including the young Michael Collins, and they try and oust him. But he fights back. Um, but he does have to make way for De Valera. So he's in that position, you know, he's, he's very active. Uh, he's, he's in jail again in 1918 because obviously he was very much associated by the British authorities with uh, Sinn Féin, but he's a vociferous opponent, uh, opponent of conscription. And when the first Doyle meets in 1919, it's very much the putting into practice in a symbolic way, of what he had been advocating for so long, which was abstention from Westminster. Because even though he, he believed in this idea of a dual monarchy, he believed in a separate Irish parliament. So that would have given him an enormous amount of satisfaction. And he's appointed Minister for Home Affairs um, in that first Doyle government, that first Sinn Féin government, and then Devizov. Devizov to the United States for 18 months, and Griffith, in his absence, is acting president. And while he's acting president, he's actually quite hands-off. He's continuing with his, his journalism and his writing and his editing, and he gets on fairly well with his colleagues. He's not quite as forceful as president as, as De Valera was. Now, we have the War of uh, Independence and then we have the treaty negotiations and Griffith was there. Griffith was not only there, Griffith was heading that delegation. He was the chairman of the delegation. And obviously two months of very long and difficult negotiations. In a sense, David Lloyd George identified Griffith as somebody who he could push towards compromise. Some would, you know, would identify that as, as, as a weak link. Um, Griffith did get involved in side meetings and was giving commitments that perhaps had not been signed up to by the whole of the uh, delegation. But you've got to remember that the treaty delegation, in a way, represents two different generations. Griffith is the older father type figure almost. And Collins is the younger uh, radical. And, you know, in a way, it, what ultimately emerges from the treaty negotiations, you know, is, is a halfway house between those yeah. two traditions. But certainly, Griffith was prepared to sign the treaty, even if his colleagues weren't. And of course, David Lloyd George says, no, that can't happen. What David Lloyd George as Prime Minister does concede towards the end of the negotiations is fiscal autonomy, which was very close to Griffith's heart, going back mm. to his, his arguments about economic uh, nationalism. But of course, the oath of allegiance is there the whole question of the Boundary Commission, the fudge, the idea that the ultimately the border would be redrawn and they all buy into that. So it is a compromise. But what he has to do is to come back and face a very, very hostile Eamon de Valera, Cahill Brew and Austin Stack, the ministers who were left uh, behind. They split 4-3 and then Griffith becomes a passionate 
defender of the treaty. And you can trace that throughout the Doyle debates on the treaty. He becomes quite personalised at times, but he also knew public opinion was with him. Um, his early death, he didn't die in action, but he died uh, unexpectedly, I well, suppose, you having could say, nursed yeah, bad health for a while. You could say he died in political action. You know, he was absolutely exhausted by 1922. Griffith is the man who's going back and forth to London to to deal with the fallout from the treaty, you know, and the British government is making all sorts of threats that if, you know, if the provisional government of the nascent free state doesn't move quickly against these anti-treaty republicans, they'll do it themselves and, and then they come up with a constitution in 1922 that's deemed to be too republican and it has to be redrawn and he's back and forth all the time and of course the British trust him, so he's an important character to have there, but he's exhausted and he's angry He's furious with the anti-treaty uh, Republicans. He doesn't have the kind of tolerance, say, that Michael Collins might have uh, towards former comrades who find themselves now mm. on the opposite side. He's very, very angry. He's exhausted. He's completely overworked. He goes into Vincent's nursing home in Easton Street and he has a cerebral hemorrhage, a brain hemorrhage, and he was only 51. And uh, it was a terrible tragedy, of course. What happened afterwards? Yeah. Michael Collins died. Um, very, very shortly afterwards, uh, less than 10 days later. There's a very famous photograph of Michael Collins, of course, that people will recognise, and that's taken of him in, in army uniform at the funeral of Arthur Griffith. And by then, he did seem a father figure to many of them. I mean, he was only 51, but he'd been around for so long. And of course, Collins and his likes, and his like are 20 years younger. Yeah. So uh, it's a terrible tragedy. And of course, that's also the period where that provisional government of the free state is, is, is waging a civil war and is becoming increasingly yes, the, the questions are often asked what would have happened if Michael Collins had survived mm. what would have happened if Arthur Griffith had survived? Well Arthur Griffith because of the signing of the treaty and the treaty debates uh, was regarded as a you know a, a very divisive figure uh, Republicans found his contributions very insulting um, and he was regarded by them as a warmonger uh, and in a way he's getting squeezed out and I often think you know when you consider the reaction to Collins so shortly after Griffith died and, and, you know, the national mourning that ensued, you don't get quite the same reaction when it comes to Arthur Griffith. But at the same time, even those who were on the opposite side to him during the Civil War recognised that he had been an absolutely pivotal figure in nurturing the nationalism that ultimately resulted in the creation of the Free State and that he deserved considerable credit for that. But he didn't always get it. Jared Fraser, Professor of Modern Irish History at UCD, thank you very much for putting Arthur Griffith back uh, centre stage in the period. Uh, coming up, I'd hear the story of a Cork woman who says she spent years suffering in silence after a teenage abortion. Don't hold back. Use the hashtag NTFM. Take the main shop challenge at Lidl this.